Hi, I'm Holly Folger, and I'm the founder and CEO of True Beauty Discovery, a nonprofit that is all about empowering women and girls to understand that it's their individuality that makes them powerful and beautiful. And I recently saw a documentary called Full Picture, and it was produced by a woman whose mission is so extraordinary. I, I was so taken with it that I contacted her and I wanted to interview her. And I'd like to introduce her to you. Her name is Santina Mua. Yep. And, and, um, and she's here with me right now. So thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for being here. Um, a little bit about Santina, she's an actress. She's a storyteller. She's a writer. She's a producer. She's a stand-up comedian. Um, she wears a lot of hats, and yeah. and you know she also had this documentary produced. Santina Muha, <laughs> just tell me, tell me a little bit about you. Just just about your mission and who you are and how you came to be at this place at this time talking, well, you came to this place at this time talking to me because I very much wanted to talk to you after seeing your film. But tell me a little bit about, about you. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for seeing, seeing me and seeing what I'm trying to do. I think, well, I, yeah, I grew up at the Jersey Shore, you know, everyone from Jersey is very proud, very, very like Jersey pride. And, um, and, but I always had California in my mind. I always wanted to move there. I loved Beverly Hills 90210 and everything California just appealed to me. And I always felt like I would live here someday. And so when I was uh, old enough, I moved out here and started pursuing my goal and, you know, my dreams of being an actress and being on television, being in media or being something with entertainment. Now, when I was six years old, I was in a car accident and I've used a wheelchair ever since from a spinal cord injury. And, um, you know, that never really, in my mind, affected the dream that I had, the lifelong dream of being on television. I wanted to be on TV since, I mean, since I saw a TV, you know, like I just wanted to get in there. I would watch the um, opening theme songs and insert myself into them somehow and just imagine where, you know, what would I do in that opening? And just, I don't know, I just felt drawn to it. And I my accident, that didn't change anything in my mind, but slowly I started to realize that societally it was an issue. And I didn't really understand why. So I have always just wanted to help just normalize this ability. Yes, are there tragic stories that you know surround spinal injury and accidents and shootings and falls and all kinds of things of course of course there's a lot of tragedy there but i also happen to know plenty of people who use wheelchairs myself being one of them who have a pretty normal very fulfilling life you know and i think a lot of times when disability is portrayed in media or whatever it's like the thing that made the person paralyzed and you know, let's like put them on a talk show and give them a souped up van. And then that's it. And then we never hear about what happened. Did they get a job? I mean, do they get married? What, what's going on? Now we're starting to hear things here and there. Thankfully, that's one of the pluses of social media with all of its downfalls. One of its pluses, I think, is that it gives us sort of control of our own narrative. And so people with disabilities are posting things about their lives sort of the everyday stuff and, and, you know, whatever they're, you know, graduation and all of this, like the normal milestones that people have, you know, um, I think that that got lost somewhere. I don't know why. And when, whenever it's portrayed, it's always either some sort of really doom and gloom version, or it's like a heroic version, or it's like something that's not heroic, but it's painted as heroic, like girl, you know, a disabled girl gets asked to the prom by football player. And it's like, that is not news. So uh, I just want, my goal is to help the next generation of disabled girls like me, you know, I was in high school in a wheelchair and that was like the toughest time because that's when you're trying to just sort of fit in. And um, I just want people to feel just like they belong here on this planet, you know? 
what was your journey like? So you were in high school in New Jersey. So you went to Rutgers, right? Yeah, I went to Rutgers. And well before that, you know, I was uh, always in plays and things like that. And I was a cheerleader in high school too. Um, And I just tried out, you know, got on the squad. It wasn't a big deal, although it was in the news. But, you know, to me, it was just whatever. Um, I always, I sort of, when I was younger, bucked against activism. I didn't want to be seen as an activist. I just wanted to blend in. Like when people would say, oh, you know, you should do wheelchair basketball or you should go do this and that. I'm like, no, 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 no. I am mainstream, as mainstream as they come. I'm going to be a cheerleader. I'm going to be in the play. I'm going to just hang out with my friends, you know, whatever. And then it's funny because, like I said, like as the only cheerleader in a wheelchair, it was sort of like, wow, did you see? Did you see the one in the wheelchair? So I couldn't help but do activism, you know, just by like going out of my house. I remember one time I was out at a club and I was just dancing with my friends and this girl comes up to me and she's like, wow, you know, I just really want to thank you for coming out tonight because I don't know, I was feeling kind of depressed. I didn't want to come out. My friends dragged me out here. But now that I see you, I realize like I shouldn't be sad about my life. And I was like, what? I was, I'm drunk. Oh, who are you? I'm having a good time with my friends. I, I don't want to talk about this. Uh, so, you know, it's like, even just me leaving my house is somehow activism, it felt like. And so um, I felt like, okay, I guess I have a res- little bit of a responsibility has been placed on me. And so, yeah, then I went to Rutgers and um, I was in a sorority, you know, I was social chair of my sorority. And just, I just felt like everything that I did was almost like inspirational by accident, you know? Right. Just by being who you are, just yeah. by kind of, kind of being in, being you. Yeah, so, because we don't see enough of that in media. No. Don't you think, I mean, I want to learn more about your past, you know, growing up and stuff, but to me, representation is so unbelievably important. And to me, the way I see it, there's such a lack of representation on so many levels in terms of, you know, just, I mean, for, for actresses, for women, for girls, for, you know, Mm -hmm. non-binary individuals, it's just, there's, there's a very little kind of narrow window of what we see and, you know, what's, like normal or what's beautiful or what's, I just think it's not, I, I, I don't like that. It, it bothers me. And which is why I started my nonprofit, which was to kind of encourage and empower women and girls to just mm-hmm. try to understand that who they are is beautiful. It, like you, like what, like, look at you, you know, look at what you're doing, what you've done, who you are. It, it, it's, it's extraordinary in and of itself. It truly is. And who you are as an actress. And and, uh, um, and so when you were in college, did you act in college? No, not really. I did more uh, communications, PR, like media stuff in college. And also I just, I just had fun. I just had so much fun in college. I love living in the dorms. I loved, you know, just being surrounded by people people my age who just like, I mean, I partied a lot. I mean, I would say what I learned about in college, those four years, I really learned more about living on my own, you know, um, learn more about myself, uh, just making doctor's appointments, uh, you know, taking myself to the, you know, buying what I need without my mo- having, sending my mom out to the store. You know, I learned more about like what it's like to be an adult uh, and take care of myself. Then I learned about geography, whatever. I don't, I honestly could barely tell you anything. I did well, I did well. I mean, I got by, but it was way more exciting for me, um, in college to learn more about just how, just, I, I had an internship at Comedy Central in New York city. So I would take the train and then like the train station and have an elevator. So I, the one by me that I could see from my dorm, I could see it, but I couldn't use it because there was an elevator. So I'd have to drive to the next town over to Edison, take that train and get into the city and then get, you know, try to get a bus, but only certain buses have the lifts and then blah, blah, blah. Was there, so I learned so much about just life and, you know, our, uh, in general and commuting and just all of that for me was like, really like what I learned in college. That's why I always 
think, you know, I always recommend to people, if you can live on campus, do that. Cause that to me is the meat of what I, what you'll learn in that, those years. What was your, okay. So, so from college, you had an internship, to, internship at Comedy Central. Like, how did you get that? Were you like, it was, did you have the, that acting thing in your heart? Like, oh, I want to be an actor or was it more stand up or like, how did that kind of develop and come to be for you as an artist? I mean, I always wanted to be an actor. I always wanted to, um, I was always drawn to television. I love films too, but television, um, I just grew up on it. You know, like it was always very bonding for my nonna and, and myself, my nonna's, she spoke mostly Italian, like hardly any English. And I was only like three or four. So we would watch sitcoms. And then when the audience would laugh, we would laugh. And we sort of were learning English and comedy together. You know, this, this 60 year old immigrant and this four year old, you know, Jersey girl, just sort of learning together. Um, and so I had a special, I've always had a special place in my heart for sitcoms and things like that and just comedy in general and I also the other thing was after I had my accident people would just oh it's so sad a little girl in a wheelchair it's just so sad so people would just look at me with pity and I'm like uh I have to break this tension at six seven years old I'm like oh my god so I would just like make jokes and then I you know people would be like oh she's okay with it and then they would get okay with it so I naturally just learned like I got to be a little bit funny or else people are just going to be sad around me. And I don't want to deal with that. So that's sort of how that happened. And then, yeah. And then I just, um, I, you know, I, I, it was that time of year where people were getting internships and I'm like, well, I, I can get one too. Why not? You know, again, we're very, there's more, I feel like in, at my age now, you know, you get older, you get a little bit jaded sort of, there's stuff now that I'm like, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. But when I was in my teens, my twenties, I was like, well, I could do it. I might do it different, but I can do it. And I, I, I mean, I'm not that jaded now, but you know how it is when you get a little older, you're like, eh, I'll just take the easier path. But in my twenties, <laughs> no way I was, I pushed myself, you know, 30 blocks or whatever it was in January in New York in freezing cold. I mean, I did it. I wanted that internship bad. Um, I went into the city. Now you couldn't pay me to go into the city twice a week. And then I did it for free, you know? So um, whatever, it, it was uh, just something I felt very drawn to and I didn't really have other things I wanted to do. Um, and so, and I just felt, you know, when so, you just feel like, you just feel stuff. You just know your life is gonna somehow have something to do with television, entertainment, comedy, whatever. And then I worked after college, I worked for the National Spinal Cord Injury Association for a few years. And that was really nice and rewarding. Um, but, and, and I worked for their newspaper and their um, sort of communications department. So I was doing a lot of what I like to do, but it was just a little too much uh, disability talk all the time. I needed comedy. I needed, you know, I wanted to meld my world. I didn't want to just be in one world. I wanted to take parts of what I loved from everything and, and put it together. You know? So when was your first acting gig? Like when was your, you know, first professional that you would say acting gig that got you kind of on the map with that? Well, my very, very first one, when I was very little, I did an Easter Seals commercial and I was so excited about that. That was my first time like, on a set, you know, but um I would say on the map, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I started taking classes at the Upright Citizens Brigade Comedy Theater. And um, it was a great experience because I made a lot of friends who were already in the business. And what was great was I started to finally break out of the box of, you know, just like actress in a wheelchair to comedic actress. And so there was this show that was on the air called Comedy Bang Bang a few years ago. And it was just a cool show. Everyone wanted to do it. You know, it was like, Weird Al was on it, you know, he was like, and it was hosted by this guy, Scott Aukerman, and all these comedians were doing it. And they asked me one time to come do a part. And it was, um, it was, it was a, a wheelchair joke, but it was a funny joke. So if it's a funny joke, I'll do it. <laughs> uh, and I went and did it. And then the cool thing was, like two years later, they had me come back and they wrote a little part for me, a recurring role. 
as Santina, the PA, you know, that was my role, the, the whatever. And that role had nothing to do with the wheelchair. It was just like me and Weird Al sort of arguing all the time. And we had like a little contentious relationship. It was so fun and funny. And that was when I really felt like, wow, I really got this part based on my comedic chops and my acting abilities and not as, you know, anybody could have gotten in this role. It has nothing to do with being in a wheelchair. And I was really proud of that. That's terrific. Um, so what year did you move to LA? Mm, I think it was, was it around 2014 or I, I don't remember exactly. I'm really numbers are not my thing, but um, it was late in my twenties. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to just go and see and because I'd rather regret doing it than regret not doing it. And then, you know, if I hate it, I can always move back to New Jersey. And I did not hate it. I did not hate it at all. <laughs> I loved it. So th there seems to be like some a kind of a fearlessness with you and, a, and such a drive, it, it seems. Because frankly, you know, for me, moving to Hollywood and, and being an actress, it's hard, right? I mean, it's not like you know, it's hard, it's, it's competitive and it's, and it's, you really have to be committed and want to do it. So I think my whole life has been hard. You know, I think that's probably part of it. Um, and I've always worked to make it easier for me, you know, like my whole life has sort of been comp competitive in a way that I always felt like I had to prove that I was just as that I could do just as much as this person, but it is harder for me to go to the store. It is harder for me to get dressed. It is harder for me to make my bed in the morning, but I had to prove I'm just like my friends. So I'm going to get dressed just like them. You know, I remember my mom when I was little, would wake up in the morning and get me dressed for school. And one day she said, Sandy, you're going to have to start doing this on your own. I mean, unless you're going to, you know, do you want your mom to get, like help you get dressed for when you're in high school and stuff. And by the way, if I couldn't do it, there are things I can't do and I need help for those things. And there is no shame in that, but I can dress myself. I can. So when she said that, that really struck me like, Oh no, I, I don't want that. So I set my alarm really early the next morning and I woke up and I got dressed before she woke up. So when she woke up, she, you know, came out of her bedroom all tired and she saw me and she was like, Oh my God. And I was felt proud. Cause I'm like, yeah, just like all my friends at school, they woke up and got dressed this morning. And so did I, and maybe it was a little harder, but that doesn't mean I can't do it. So I think that mindset was ingrained in me, you know? So, so yeah, go, moving to Hollywood and becoming an actress is hard, but I do hard things, you know, I never really thought of it that way, but that's probably that sure. That was a part of it. And then also I know you said fearless. I am not, I don't consider myself fearless. Um, I'm afraid of stuff. I was afraid to move out here for sure. But I think with me, there always comes a tipping point where the fear of not doing something outweighs the fear of doing it where I'm like, oh man, what if I turn, you know, 30 and I haven't tried this and then I'm going to be like, I never did it. And so that's why sort of late in my twenties, I was like, what are you going to do? You know? And then I was more afraid of not trying, but fear almost drives me more than fearlessness. I was um, more afraid of not doing it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Fear drives exactly. me, I think sometimes. Oh, that's amazing. You've done a lot. <laughs> yeah, you know I guess I mean? so. It's you... hard to, you know, when I think that a lot of people have this problem, especially in my world where we don't feel like we've done as much as it probably looks like from the outside. What do you mean? I don't know what you mean. I always feel like I should be doing more. You know, like I haven't done this yet. I haven't done that yet. I'm not, I'm not a household name. I'm not, you know, like I'm still chasing something, you know? Oh, you've done, you know, you're on Dollface right now, right? Y yes. I, yeah, I was on the second season of Dollface. That's on Hulu right now. Um, um, Mackenzie Phillips, uh, one day at a time. One day at a time, yeah, yeah, that must have been which cool. is awesome because that's one of the sitcoms I used to watch with my nonna growing up, and yeah. then I got to be on the reboot, which was so full circle and great. I used to see her at auditions. You when, did. I'm more her age, yeah, and I see her at auditions when when we, yeah, and I just was like, you know, I used to watch that show too, and I just loved it. So yeah, 
I, yes. I, she's incredibly cool. Um, but yes. yeah, your resume, I mean, it's kind of amazing. And the other thing that's amazing, where I saw you was again at, at a film festival in Cleveland for this movie, this short called uh, Full Picture. Now, how'd you, that was also during COVID, right? You're very create. I mean, it seems like you've got that, the creativity you know, in spades, you got it going on. But, um, <laughs> but that documentary was just, it was so moving to me. Um, so do you want to tell, talk about it a little? I can set the stage, but it's-, it's Yeah, your, well, I'm interested to hear what you found moving about it. What did you like about it? I just found that your spirit and your commitment and your honesty and just, just you, the way you dealt with it, the way you talk to people and the way when, when, you know, you, you introduced yourself, you know, you, who you are, you know, being in a wheelchair, it was just, and, and it wasn't like, mean or you know like see or anything like that it was yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean well, we weren't trying to do like um a dateline special you know we were we were really we wanted it it was just something I was curious in about um because you know basically I'll set up the doc it's it I realized in quarantine that I was meeting people on zoom. And so they didn't know I was in a wheelchair until maybe it came up in conversation or I would have to say something about it because I was, they were only seeing me from here up. And I'm like, this is so interesting. Cause usually when I meet people, it's the first thing they notice. And then it's almost always one of the first things they ask me about what happened or, Oh, my aunt's in a wheelchair. So I understand this or that or whatever, you know? And so um, and I feel like then everything I tell them is through this lens of like, oh, you were in a wheel. Like if I say to somebody, oh yeah, I was in like school plays. Oh, wow. You were in school plays in a wheelchair. It's like everything gets this like colored by it. And it was really cool to be like, I can have a conversation with someone and then them just get to know me as a person. And then I can tell them in a wheelchair and then they can reassess however they want. So I wanted to kind of exp uh, explore that a little bit. And yeah, I had some friends who were down to help me, you know, do that, do the experiment with me. And, you know, we didn't have to go anywhere for it, which we weren't going anywhere at that time because of COVID. And um, it was fun. It was a fun little experiment. I learned a little bit about myself too throughout, which I thought was cool. Um, I learned that because so many people uh, are so preoccupied with the wheelchair, I have a guard up where I just think everybody is thinking it. So if I'm on a date or if I'm in a job interview or if I'm just meeting someone for the first time, maybe they're not thinking about it. Maybe they have a sister in a wheelchair and they're so used to it. It's like not on their radar or maybe they just don't care. But I still in the back of my head is my uh, thinking, hmm, I wonder when they're going to ask or I wonder when the shoe's going to drop or I wonder if, you know, they wish I wasn't it. Like everything's going great, but oh, if only I wasn't in a wheelchair. So I sort of like am paranoid about it almost or I'm prejudging myself before they can maybe as like a protection but it was nice to see not everybody cared about it and then I'm like okay so maybe maybe it is not isn't everybody but it is just so many people that I am like my guard is just up I'm like here we go you know I remember one day I was going around um and everybody was just staring at me all day as usual and I'm like everyone's looking at me weird because I'm in a wheelchair. And then I went home and realized it was Ash Wednesday and I had dirt, I had dirt on my face, you know? And it was like smudge. <laughs> it didn't have, didn't look like Ash, it was just like smudge. So I'm like, oh, maybe some people were looking at that, you know? But it's just in my head that I, I get, I'm a little, I'm a little on guard, but not for, for no reason though. You know what I mean? It's hard that when like I'm at the grocery store and someone comes up to me and asks me what happened? And I'm like- They do? Oh my God, all the time. And it's like, I wasn't thinking about my car crash at this moment, but thanks for bringing it up. You know what I mean? What happened to you? Rude. Anyone, you know, your parents get divorced, anyone abuse you? Like, shall we talk about it? You know, it's like, the hell? My yeah, that yeah. seems kind of awful. It, it happens all the time and people can't believe it. But I'm telling you, I promise you, 
Not until you're my friend or you're around with me or you go out with me, do you really get to experience. My friends are like, oh my God. Or they'll be like, why is every, do you realize everyone is staring? And I'm like, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm over it, but I'm, it's the first time I went to the mall after two years of not going to the mall. And I'm a Jersey girl, so I love the mall. But the first time I went to the mall um, after a kind of quarantine, people were staring at me in the mall and I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about this because I hadn't been out in so long, you know? And um, I remembered feeling like, ugh, I hate this. Everyone's staring at me. And then now I've been out and, you know, whenever I'm back, I went to the mall. Maybe the they're mall. staring at you because they recognize you. And maybe, maybe some people recognize me, but you know, I know. but I, there's a look, there's a, there's a look, you know, it's, it's kind of like goes up and down and kind of a little bit of a pity head tilt. You know, I can see when someone's looking at me like this or when they're kind of like, or if it's a guy who's checking me out, I kind of can tell the difference. At yeah. This point. yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, so in terms of where you're going to go next, what you're going to do, I mean, I know that you're very much an advocate um, and your work is, is ultimately, you know, just from being you and your work that you're doing, being on screen and, and being an actress, it does shift, you know, it, it, it does shift just kind of how things are seen, which again, I think is extraordinary and, you know, huge, uh, thanks to you for doing, I mean, it, it's, you know, it, it's what an opportunity for a child or somebody, you know, like I bet when you were little, you know, the thought of, of a kid who, you know, may happen to be in a wheelchair, or any kid who has anything, seeing themselves represented in the media and allowing that to happen is so important. It's yeah. so important. And it it's, it's, to, it, you know, I remember watching Beverly Hills 90210 and in one of the establishing shots of the college before the show ever, you know, before the show started, there was a woman in a wheelchair pushing herself on the campus. And I thought to myself, oh my God, I could go to college in California if I wanted. Like just seeing that connected these dots for me that I could go to college and I could live in California, you know? And um, there's just, there was so little representation. And then when there was representation back in my day, it was always the very special episode, you know? And so I was like, it, that's why when I was very, when I was first injured, my friends didn't care about it at all. It was like, okay, this, this, we're in elementary school. This girl's tall. This girl's adopted. This girl's, you know, has, has like missing her front, two front teeth, whatever. This girl's parents are divorced. We're all, we all have different lives. That's what life is, right? Everyone's different. Then television and things started to implant these ideas in our head. And then it was like, the, like we all watched Saved by the Bell. And there was that one episode of Saved by the Bell where the girl comes in, she's in a wheelchair and everyone's shocked. And I remember feeling like, why is everyone treating her so weird? And then it kind of like, that was a turning point in a negative way for me because people would also be watching those shows and be like, oh, it's weird that she's in a wheelchair. I didn't know that. And then they would start sort of treating me differently. Middle school was the worst the middle school to high school for me was like a nightmare because that's when you just want to fit in and everyone wants to wear the same clothes and everyone wants to be the same. Things are a little bit different now and they're getting better. But in my day, ugh, it was horrible being different in, in those, you know, age, in those, those years. So, and I remember when <clears throat> Christopher Reeve was injured, I was a young girl and people were trying to set him up as some as a role model for me. And in ways he was, but also I was like an 11 year old girl and he was like a 40 year old man. So I was like, I guess, but I don't see the connection because he's in a wheelchair, but what else are, you know? And yeah, so I was like, where's my like Kelly Kapowski in the wheelchair? Where's my Britney Spears, you know, or whatever my, whoever in a wheelchair, someone that I could put the posters on my wall and not, you know, and, and really feel like cool, fun. This is a fun, you know, Alyssa Milano or, or you know, someone like that, like the people I grew up with, J-Lo, you know, how, where was my, that person in a wheelchair? And we still don't really have, I mean, it's very difficult to name, 
famous, if I asked you to name three famous actors in wheelchairs right now, I mean, not many people could do it. Only if you're in the business or in the disability community, could you do it, I think, or you're, you know, somehow. But if you're just regular Joe on the street, I don't think they could name one. And, it, you know, maybe two, I don't know. It's, there's just not enough of it. It's um, getting better, but it's very slow in the process. Do you, do you realize that you're a role model and that, um, that you're making an impact? Do you understand that? Do you, I mean, you might not because you seem so, uh, you know, you're just doing your, you, you're just sort of, you know, so, but, but in so many ways. It's yeah, I think so. Certainly uh, day to day, you know, one-to-one, -one, I think I definitely am, but I am just so eager for a bigger platform, you know, because I know that I can reach you know, let's say 50 people saw, were in the audience with you that day seeing full picture. Reach those 50 people. I need, I want bigger, I want a bigger scale. You know, I just, I'm so desperate for a bigger platform. I think that's why I pursue this career that I'm in because I know people, society listen to celebrities. They, they're, you know, whether they want to or not, or, or, or they're, even if it's bad, even if they hate somebody, if they're still at least seeing, even if someone doesn't like me, at least they can see that I'm out there doing stuff. And then, you know, then God forbid their child has an accident. They don't, they can know that it's not the end of the world. It's not, you know, one of these movies like Million Dollar Baby or something where the end of it is suicide. But it could be, you know, okay, you'll, you'll go to college, you'll, you know, or you'll get a job, you know, whatever it is, they'll see there's life after a disability. I don't think we see enough of that. And so I'm just so, ugh, I just have been just, I'm just so eager for a bigger platform, you know. What's your bigger platform? Just continuing to work and. Yeah, and, just doing yeah. more. And I've written, I'm writing a book right now and I'm writing a movie right now. And I just want to reach more people. And, you know, like, oh God, I know that I'll feel so um happy when i get to do the the talk show circuit you know when i get to be like when i'm promoting something and i'm just so ooh, eager to do that and also by the way i also would love to be you know um on the view or a host you know like hosting because i love that too i love just talking to people i don't i like acting but i also love being myself and talking and connecting with people i love that so anything where I'm sort of in the public eye and not because, yeah, of course I, I've, oh, I love a spotlight. You know, my family and friends will tell you that forever. That's no secret. I'm not embarrassed to say that, but more than that, I just love connecting with people and I want people to see, see that, you know, just see it in action. Um, I love it. I think, yeah. you, I think you're amazing. A uh, couple more questions. Let me ask you what, what do you think beauty is? Oh, I think that, um, you know, I, I know it has, I know it's confidence. I know confidence has a lot to do with it, right? Because um, if you feel beautiful and you don't care what anyone else thinks, you start to become more attractive, I think, you know? Um, that's really, that's, a, that's such a huge part of it, confidence. And, um, you know, I mean, I think that there's different types of, of, of beauty, probably, you know, there's like nature, nature is so beautiful. And in, in the fact that it just keeps persisting and, you know, and kind of weathers the storm and then it comes back again, you know, and, it sort of, there's like a quiet, conf again, confidence in nature that knows like the storm is going to end, the snow is going to melt, the sun will come out again. You know, it's like, it's about that. It's about sort of knowing that even when there's like just dirty snow on the ground, it's going to melt and it will be, you know, not the first snow, the first snow is beautiful. But then like that second and third day when it's just like gross and being pushed into the sidewalk, it, but knowing 
and and not panicking and knowing that that will melt and things will be back again because that's what life is right it's just a series of this and i just recently spent the the whole first half of this year way down here um you know i was i had a few a, a death of a friend a death of a family member i myself was checked into the hospital for a month um after a long battle of doctors not believing me and having to sort of fight and be a patient at my own advocate, which I've had to do before in the past. And it's exhausting mentally and physically. And I had to put all my writing aside because I had no creative energy left in me. All my energy went to saving my life. You know, it went to my health and just knowing inside, okay, when, once I get through this and I will, because I have, I always have before, I'll get back to writing and I'll get back to my thing. And I did. And now I'm back writing again. I'm waking up, getting out there with my, you know, my tea and my thing and I'm writing. And so it's like that period where I don't, I, I wasn't panicking. I wasn't like, my career is over. My, I'm moving back home. That's it. You know, it's like that quiet confidence of like things will come back. And I don't have it all the time. You know, every once in a while I'll be scrolling on Instagram and see someone up here of mine, you know, booking something or doing, having some great, you know, getting engaged or some great milestone announcement. And maybe that day I'm not, I don't have much going on and I'll be, you know, pitying myself a little bit. I think that's normal, but you're allowed to have those feelings, but just knowing overall it's, it's going to come back up. And then guess what? It's going to go back down again. So be ready for that when you're in the highs too, you know, like appreciate the highs, live in the highs, but get ready because that's my, anyway, maybe that's not everybody's life, but I know that that's mine. And so I've sort of come, you know, come to terms with that pattern. <laughs> I think you are extraordinary. I think you're so beautiful. Oh. And you're just being in your spirit and your, it's, it's, it's breathtaking. It really is. I was so, I, again, when I saw your documentary, I was just, I was so, I was moved by it, but I was also, I, I just, I laughed and it just, it was so lovely and it was so life affirming and it was so much about perception and, and beauty and who you are as a human being. And I just think you embody that. And I, I'm, I thank you so much for talking with me. I really thank do because so this is me. so very much what what um, True Beauty Discovery is all about. And can thank I ask you. you what legend you are? Yes, and it's funny that you asked that because I got the activist. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's like no matter what I try to do, that's who I am. I, I so love that. Oh, it's yeah. so it's so interesting. You know, like. Like I either, I get the dreamer or the luminary. You know, I try different okay. times. Those are my, mine, but the activists, like uh, that that's pretty amazing. And of course you're the activist, right? I mean, of I course guess, you want to you. I guess, I mean, sure. I don't, again, it's not something I ever sought out to do. Uh, and I'm not, I wouldn't even consider myself as great an activist. I have friends who are marching all around the town all the time for stuff. And I just don't but but i feel like that's because i have found my own sort of way to because like i said when i worked at the spinal cord injury association i felt like that was activism but i also felt like i was preaching to the choir a lot and i learned that i could write as many articles about you know why you shouldn't use the handicapped stall in public restrooms as I wanted and nobody cares. But then I go up on stage and do a joke about it. And I, you know, I call it the curse word for pooping stall. I'm like, what? I'm like, why is everybody always in there taking a beep? You know, I'm like, why don't they, you know, and I make this whole joke about it and how I like to wait outside when someone's doing that and see the wheels and really stress them out. You know, it's a whole joke. Okay. <laughs> and then there are, <laughs> there are far more people who have so seen that joke in my standup and said to me, Oh God, I saw your, your standup. I'm never using the handicap stall again. Then there are people who are like, wow, I read your expose on wheelchair accessible restrooms." you know? So I have found not to say that exposes and stuff don't work, but for me, I have found that I, my brand, I can reach more people with my comedy and with my sort of 
like I said, personal connection than I can standing outside of a bathroom, you know, holding a sign. And and I'm having way more fun doing it that way. So win-win, you know? But that's activism. You're but just doing it your way. That's what I mean. It's it's accidental activism. Oh, but it's wonderful. That it's I don't, wonderful. To it's me, I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to go tell jokes and do what I want to do. And then I somehow end up reaching more people that way. And I'm like, okay, I guess, you know what I mean? Whatever works. So I, and I, I've always tried to sort of like hide the vegetables in the brownie, you know, and that's what I was trying to do with this documentary. And I'm so glad you said that you laughed because I think people uh, learn more when they're laughing. Like, you know, there are people who will go to a Ted talk and sit there and listen, but there are a lot of people who won't. And those people more often than not are the people that need the lessons the most. So if you tell them, hey, watch this funny comedy movie, and then they leave the movie being like, wow, I just learned so much about disability without even knowing it. To me, that's how you're going to get the people who aren't watching the TED Talks, who aren't reading self-help books. They don't want to hear it. So you got it. And those people have to get, we have to reach them too. So that I feel like is my mission is sort of to like reach the the people who don't want to hear it. Because I feel like I can feed it to them in a way that they're like, Oh, okay. You got me there. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's fun for me. It's like a challenge. It's fun. I'm, I'm from New Jersey, but I live in LA, you know, so I have a little bit of that like gruffness, but then I also have a little bit of that, you know, I call myself a boho guido, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I can do that. I feel like I can reach the, the sort of people who are like shut down. They don't want to hear it. Cause I know I have that. I don't want to hear it. I want to hear it. I know that that personality. They're, they're, those are my aunts. Those are my, you know, my family members. So I know how to reach them, I think, in a way that's more palatable. And and it's just like more fun to me. Oh, well, I'm an activist, I guess. You are. Oh, I love it. Um, thank you. I, oh, I, thank I you. cannot wait to watch how everything unfolds for you. I'm, I'll be one of your biggest you. fans out there. Thank you. Always, always call me and just be like, Okay, I'm here, and I'll be like, "All right, well, let's go here," <laughs> because thank you. because you have uh, you're extraordinary, and thank you for your time, and thank you for your for just you. Oh my god, thank you, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yep. Anything? A- any other um, things you want us you want people to know before we sign off, or you know, any? And no, I mean, just follow me on Instagram at Santina Muha, and then you'll be able to keep up with it, whatever I'm doing. And um, I have a movie coming out I did with Jane Fonda and, and um, Lily when? Tomlin. So that's exciting. And um, just a scene, I just have a scene in the movie, but still to work with them, are you kidding me? And um, I have some voiceover work, work I've done. So I'm a, a voice in some cartoons coming up. So, you know, a few things in the pipeline and um, you can follow along mo- I, mostly uh, on Instagram. That's right. I will follow along. I, I promise. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. And um, we'll just, we'll just watch your, we'll just watch you change the world. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, I you will. I, I do want to, that's, that's the goal, right? Leave the world a little better than you found it. Yep. I think you if we have. all did focused on that, that would, that would be a, a, a little bit better of a place. You'll do that. You are doing that. So. You are. Thank yes, you, you are. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.